All right, thank you once again, Michael. Our next speaker is the author of Redesigning Humans and another book called Metaman, The Merging of Humans and Machines into a Global Superorganism. He's also the director of, prog of a program on medicine and technology at UCLA Medical School. And he just stepped down as the CEO of Signum Biosciences, which is a company that develops treatments for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Please welcome Gregory Stock to the stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's really good to be here. And I love coming to the Signularity Summit because, you know, it's a group of really smart people who have been thinking a lot about the enormity of the changes that are taking place today. And they really realize that they're so profound and so powerful that it's leading to a real transition. And you don't know exactly what that'll be. It's something that is that we really can't see, which is why, you know, Werner Vinge's choice in his uh, Marooned in Real Time was so good, where he suddenly just pictured the disappearance of humans, this uh, landscape devoid of humanity. So uh, he didn't have to make a choice of what that would look like. And in the face of all of this very, very rapid change and the possibility of things occurring that seem so enormous, what's interesting is that, you know, the things that we really care about or that a lot of people care about, if they're sick or if you're getting older, uh, like the development of new therapeutics, of new preventives, these sorts of things seem to be moving at a very, very slow pace. And, you know, here's a Time Magazine cover from of all of the new possibilities that were going to be emerging a decade ago. And, you know, the reality hasn't quite come up to that. I mean, the reality is that uh, the expenditure of R&D money, the pink area up there, has just gone up and up and up. It's over uh, 45 billion now a year. And the creation of new medical entities has decreased, actually, in the pharmaceutical arena. And so, you know, you have to kind of wonder, uh, where are all the wonder drugs that we were promised? And one of the answers to that is the FDA, I think, where they've such a focus on process and uh, such a focus on safety and avoiding anything bad happening that you've got something which is very, very, very expensive as a process that it's, very, it's become very risk averse because it is so, so long. And so that's one of the answers. But I think another one is that actually it's really hard where biology is very, very complex. And when you get into these um, diseases of aging and all of the processes that you're trying to affect, it's, it's very, very difficult to do it in an effective manner. And, you know, it, there's a problem if you start to develop something like uh, anti-aging me medicines or something in that the clinical process is now up, it's eight years. So there's a real lag time uh, between the time that you have something that's innovative and the time that it can actually get through the clinic and get to people. And, um, you know, that may not have the same impact on uploading since you'll already be clinically dead, but it wouldn't surprise me if the FDA would want to get involved in that as well. Um, so you have to wonder, at least I do, whether, uh, uh, well, wait, here's, it's not because you're not getting more data. Here's some of the, these design, the the cost of sequencing is absolutely collapsing. I mean, this is, you know, four orders of magnitude in about six years. It leaves the advances uh, in, in Moore's law, the uh, reductions or the increases in computing power uh, in the dust, okay? And there's been a real explosion of data as a result of that, not just from the genome, but from proteomics, from all of the materials that are being developed through medical records. I mean, we have lots of data. And what's come about as a result of that is that we've realized how much more we need. Systems biology, we want, we want data at a cellular level, at a tissue level. And so, you know, I know that with uh, exponential processes that you really get the benefit after you get off a while and suddenly it takes off, but you have to be going down the right process if you want to see the benefits of it in a reasonable amount of time. And so you, you can easily wonder or at least I do, whether I'll live long enough to be able to see anything that's singularity-like. And um, I think that Ray, who will be talking next, 
uh, thinks he'll make it to the bridge to the future in some way, and with a little bit of help from a lot of uh, uh, medicinals of one form or another. Uh, you know, I'm not so confident of that, actually. And uh, I saw his uh, new film, the, which he and Martin Rothblatt put together, and it's a great film. It really captures in a very fun and enjoyable way a lot of the possibilities of the future. If you haven't seen it, I think you should. And um, it's, it's sort of this feel-good fantasy. And, but what it highlighted for me was this paradoxical vision that all of these mind-bending changes that are going to be for strong artificial intelligence and human uploads and stuff are going to somehow lead to you know, the triumph of love and human values, rather than to what seems more likely to me, the extinction of what we view as the human through its transformation. So it's sort of a pseudo-extinction into something other, something foreign, something different, at least in the cyber realm. Um, so that, that idea seems so obvious to me that at the opening reception, I went up uh, to Ray and sort of started to talk to him about it because I thought he'd say, well, you know, you, you have to make a film and it have to has equalities for it to be successful. But he didn't. He said, no, he thought it was very reasonable that you would have the persistence of this, this human, the human stuff that we value in this other realm. So I thought I would talk about this. And to me, it seems very contradictory to envision this singularity that is so opaque and so dramatically different and then somehow postulate that we're going to be able to reach through it in some way to maintain the values that we primates happen to, to care about and somehow to shape its character in some way. And I think that the reality is that this, we don't have a clue where this is going and we have very, very limited tools to do anything more than to sort of get a glimpse of it and maybe to alter when it's going to happen precisely, but not its character. Um, so ultimately, you know, here we sit. And we're well aware of the possibilities and how amazing this sort of unfettered sort of cyber realm and the possibilities of technology. But we're meat. I mean, that's who we are. We're flesh and blood. And it's very, very poignant. And I think that it was captured particularly well uh, by Yates in the 1920s when he said, consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fasten to a dying animal, it knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. Now, before I discuss why I think that human values are not going to survive in, in cyberspace, uh, Michael Vassar asked me to speak a little bit about some of the stuff that I've been doing at uh, Signum Biosciences on Alzheimer's uh, for the last five years, where I was the CEO and founder of that company. And, uh, Alzheimer's is something that, you know, the cognitive declines, or should you say cognitive collapse related to Alzheimer's, is something really worthwhile to look at, regardless of whether you're trying to just sort of shoot for this bridge to the future, or whether you're trying to preserve something that is actually worth freezing, or whether you're just hoping to be able to remember who you are for a little bit longer. Uh, because it is the poster child of unmet medical need, and very, very slow therapeutic development of anything that's useful. Its prevalence is really high. If you live to be 85 years old, there's about a 50% chance that you'll be afflicted by Alzheimer's in some way or another, which isn't a very great prospect. And, uh, you know, despite all the exuberance, here's another one of these Time magazine covers, the year 2000, the new science of Alzheimer's. It was like just around the corner that this was going to be a disease of the past. Here we are a decade later, failures in all those clinical realms, and essentially there's been no progress in 20 years in that realm. Nothing works, okay? So my company, Signum Biosciences, um, we have an unusual approach, and that's to look at some master regulatory elements that are regulating regulatory proteins, hundreds of them. And uh, one of the major ones is PP2A, protein phosphatase 2A, which is a phosphatase. It removes phosphates from regulatory proteins. Kinases add phosphates. The level of phosphorylation either upregulates or downregulates all of these proteins. It's not a very good uh, site for drug discovery because of the possibility of all sorts of pleiotropic multiple effects. 
And, um, but dysregulation of something fundamental like that over time can not only lead to the kinds of issues that you see in Alzheimer's, but, uh, and there's a lot of reason to believe that, but all sorts of other diseases of aging as well. Things just get out of kilter. So we decided not to screen vast libraries, not only because we didn't have resources, but because you get all sorts of things are hits and most of them are toxic. Um, but if this was really central to regulation of our bodies, of our biochemistries, then if we looked at some medicinals that are, you know, these complex mixtures of biochemicals and bioactives, then we should see stuff that affected this. And if we didn't, then probably we were wrong. We'd come up with a story, as Michael would say, that sounded good, but probably uh, wasn't, a good, wasn't real. So we looked at some things that maybe you've heard of, things like coffee. You can sleep when you're dead. I like that poster. Um, and uh, butcher's broom, chocolate, um, St. John's wort, uh, chocolate, of course. I mean, if all these things work, you can sort of see, see a path to a new dietary regime. Um, and uh, about a third of them impact PP2A. That was very encouraging, but, you know, what kind of a gunk would it be? And who knows? No. So um, what we did was we wanted to look at coffee in particular because it has some great epidemiological data because it's such a strong, strong beverage that everybody drinks. This is reduced incidence of diabetes for people who drink significant amounts of coffee. It turns out that heavy drinkers of coffee, if you drink four or more cups of coffee a day, half the level of Parkinson's, half the level of type 2 diabetes, and that's irrespective of whether there's any caffeine involved, so it's not related to caffeine. It's actually a really good thing to drink. And we went and started to isolate whatever that activity was, a, a molecule, it's a small molecule, we call it SIG1012, and very high levels in espresso, 10 to 20-fold higher levels in espresso, which I drink a lot of right now. Uh, <laughs> even though I get in trouble for being too hyper for that. Anyway, the next step we did is we took this stuff, we fed it to mice. We, can we kill mice with this thing? We, we, it's a small molecule. We synthesized it. And uh, no, you can't. You can give them as much as you want orally. It doesn't hurt them. It just sort of helps their weight. Uh, they don't get fat as easily when they're fed ad lib. And put it in tissue culture. It seems to have the kinds of impacts that you would think it had. And so we went into transgenic mouse, models for both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. These things aren't really good at predicting disease very well, but nonetheless, they're a, a good research tool. Uh, with the support from the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, we went into these uh, uh, JNPL43 mice, and uh, it delays the onset of motor impairments that arrive with these over a period of time. It extends their lives. Very, very encouraging thing, and that's just feeding them a bunch of this, putting it in their food. And same thing with Mark Parkinson's mouse models. After a while, after nine months, these mouse models, uh, they can't make nests. They can't tear apart the paper and stuff that they use to make nests, which is there. And uh, if you feed these transgenics, this compound, SIG1012, it really reduces that level of uh, inability to make nests. So the next thing that we're doing is moving into human trials. And we can do that immediately because it's something that comes out of coffee. It's in the food supply, so we can get a grass generally recognized as a safe designation and do a real clinical trial. And if we're successful, you have a medical food that can be on the market immediately, because I would actually like to use something while I can still remember what we're trying to do. Uh, and we're building a bunch of related derivatives. So if we're successful with that, it will be uh, really fantastic, and it sort of turns on end a lot of the things that are doing in uh, terms of pharmaceutical development. So that, in brief, is what we're doing on that. The, um, let me go back to human values and the singularity now. And in that area, um, it's what do you do to get a feel for this idea of persistence of human values? And Michael did a great idea, a, a great presentation on uh, evolution and the significance of that and how that's worked through the scientific uh, uh, process, scientific uh, method. Well, to me, it offers macroevolution is going to tell us a lot about what the nature, or make some suggestions about the, what the nature of this stuff might be, or where we're going. So there are two things that are absolutely unprecedented that are underway today. Uh, and the first of these is the silicon revolution. And 
what's happening as cores, we're taking the inert sand at our feet, silicon dioxide, and we're breathing a level of complexity that rivals life itself. We're essentially animating the inanimate world around us, and nothing is ever going to be the same, and this stuff is moving very, very rapidly on its own, which everybody here is aware of and which we'll hear a lot about as we move forward. The second revolution is a child of this first revolution. It couldn't happen without this, and it's the genomics revolution, the revolution in molecular biology, where we're actually, life is coming to understand itself, its own workings, at a level where it can actually begin to intervene in that process, alter those processes, adjust them, modify them, essentially to take control of our own evolutionary process. And these things, basically what's happened is that science and technology has slammed the evolutionary process into fast forward. And as I said before, it's not clear where this is going to carry us, but some things are underway. A transformation is really underway. It's obvious to anybody who steps back and looks at what's going at it that big things are happening that are represented discontinuity. The changes that are occurring with living systems in the organic realm and in the inorganic realm are tied together. These are not independent and in conflict. They are uh, completely linked. And the third is that you have to weather, wonder whether we ourselves will be transcended in this process as it plays out. And that's what I'm going to talk about, uh, the focus for the rest of my uh, talk. And I think that evolution here is the key. It offers us a way to think about this process. And people usually think of biological evolution as this static process that is acting on biological organisms on life in order to bring changes, maybe more complexity, more adaptation to the environment. But in fact, evolution is not static. Evolution itself is evolving, the process of evolution, because as more potent ways of evolving more effectively are embedded in the life forms that are evolving, well, they completely uh, displace less effective evolutionary processes. And so you get advances in the evolutionary process, like, for example, sexual reproduction. That was a big step for evolution. And, you know, I can't mention sex without a few gratuitous photos of it, so I thought I'd entertain you with those. Uh, first of all, here are some uh, earthworms that are completely locked in passionate embrace here. Um, here are some Japanese beetles that are uh, enjoying themselves. Uh, here are some zebras, which make a nice, some nice color patterning there. Uh, and then you get, it's going on everywhere under the ocean with some squid. And uh, here's a hoverflies that are, uh, uh, you know, very acrobatic. And then you have things that are a little bit closer to home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this isn't the only place. So this is everywhere because it's such an advance in the evolutionary process. But actually, there are other kinds of advances that are significant, too social evolution and the integration of technology, which allows these big changes to occur that, expect, that alter populations. And the biggest one that's occurring right now is that you can actually have competition in a virtual realm where you don't have to waste all of the energy to actually build something for it to, have comp to be competed, you know, ideas, plans, concepts, which makes it much, much more efficient. So, the evolutionary process is just accelerating very rapidly. And, you know, traditional Darwinian evolution that's sort of plodding alone along on a biological scale, uh, it's, it's, it's being displaced, okay? And the essentials of evolution are you have to have creation of copies, creation of offspring, reproduction. There has to be variation so that there's differences that be, can be competitive, and there has to be differential survival. And that's really all there is to it. And that operates in all sorts of different realms. And uh, when I talked about pure Darwinian evolution, well, the problem is you're not going to get any exponentials there because the generation time is too damn long. And there's no way you're going to get around that. And so this will be very, this will be significant, but there are things that are orders of magnitude more rapid that are really taking place and that are shaping the human future. Now, I want to talk, I've talked about, said I'd talk about macroevolution. Well, there are significant 
evolutionary breakthroughs that have happened in the past. And I think it's worthwhile to talk about them because there have only been a few of them. And they've been in two areas. One of them is in organizational complexity, organization, and the other is in the materials that make up life. And those shifts have been profound. Uh, the first of them was gigantic, life out of non-life where you essentially, this is a, an E. coli, and it's just a little tiny, about a micron bag of biochemicals. There's no internal structure or anything. Uh, this is what arose three and a half billion years, roughly. And the oldest form was blue-green algae. That's a photo of blue-green algae in the present. There is a, uh, the Warawuna group, which is uh, uh, the old fossils in Australia that are three and a half billion years ago. And basically, what they house is life. This is the stuff of life. This was extracted from Roach's general metabolism. It's a tiny, tiny part of it. But this is, the, is chemistry and what has been biological life. And it's the same in every organism now. So that's when life was de developed. And then the next shift was to complex cells, to eukaryotic cells. They're about a million times the volume. They have all sorts of internal compartments. They have a nucleus. They have mitochondria, which actually have bacterial origins. So it was symbiotic communities of bacteria that then became so tightly uh, organized together that they became essentially an organism that's orchestrating its own activity. That happened about 2.2 billion years ago. And that remained the story until the next, which was to multicellular organisms about 1.2 billion years ago, when they began to orchestrate these sort of complex time-dependent associations. And here we have a volvox, which is a very, very simple uh, multicellular life. Uh, here are the more familiar sort of charismatic mammals that everybody uh, likes to think about a lot and try and protect. Uh, here you have a gigantic jellyfish. Uh, it's about 400 pounds. And there's something, I, it's hard to recognize, but some sort of a fiborg or something there that's next to it seems to be breathing underwater, but in that same grouping. And uh, now what we have is right at this instant is a similar kind of uh, a transition that's occurring, and that's to a planetary superorganism, where technology and biology is integrated together. This is a picture of the uh, United States at night. And um, you know, there's the internet connections. This is from the Opti project in 2005, just exploding all this bandwidth of communications between these component parts. And then, you know, it's manifested physically as well. Here's Hong Kong. This is not the stomping ground of our Pleistocene ancestors by any measure. Here's New York. Uh, everywhere is the same, these sort of ideal environments for us to live in. And, you know, the idea of a superorganism or the, the reality of a superorganism is nothing that's completely new. Uh, here's uh, a termite superorganism. And look what little termites are able to create. Uh, they are. Oops. And you know, when you think of the increased complexity of the individual components, of the enormous bandwidth of communication that's possible, and of the numbers of elements that are involved, all of which are exploding, you get a feel for what the potential and the power of this new union at that level is bringing about, and why we will probably move towards a, a singularity. But before we do that, oh, and this is that this notion of a planetary superorganism, this isn't metaphor. I mean, it's a fantastic metaphor, and it's usually used as a metaphor, but this is, is reality. This is actually a creature. And it's got very tightly orchestrated internal networks. It's got a digestive and a circulatory system, which I've talked about in my previous book. It's got a nervous system. I mean, it really has processes for orchestrating its internal behaviors and for, for doing lots of things. I won't get into those details now. Uh, very robust, redundant internal systems. Uh, there's a lot of very brutal internal competition that's going on uh, at, the, at its systems level, at a subcomponent level. And you know, we don't recognize it as such because we think of organisms as having membranes. But the advances in materials allow it to function, to be an organism without having that kind of a membrane. And so constituent materials. I said there were organizational breakthroughs, and there are also uh, breakthroughs in materials. And the most important, I think, is to look at one that occurred 560 million years ago. And that was 
when simple biology, cells, tissue, took simple non-biology, calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate, that it was excreting into the environment, and learned not to just excrete it, but to fashion it into something of value. So it was able to create bones. With calcium phosphate, which is more complicated and more nuanced, it created skeletons, which made possible all the macroscopic life that's around us, all the things that were in this last transition to metazoans. And now, 560 million years later, what's happening is that complex biology, you know, our cerebral cortex, basically, plus very complicated non-biology, all of the computer chips, all of the things that we're all very aware of, have come together to form this planetary superorganism that, as I said, is, goes way beyond metaphor. Uh, so that is kind of the transition. And when, when you look at this thing, um, let's see. I said that we were going to look at these transitions. These are all fundamental transitions. They happen every billion years or half a billion years. And we're in the midst of one right now. And it's one in both substance and in organizational complexity. And what can we say about that from looking at the past ones? Does it tell us anything? I think it does. I think it tells us that when new materials uh, arrive, they don't displace, but they supplement old ones. So you get these integrated structures. At least I hope that's the case, but I think it bodes well for there being some biology remaining in this future system, at least here on this planet. The second thing is that you get new levels of complexity that subsume older ones. So biology and individual organisms can exist within this entity so just as cells exist within us, just as bacteria in the form of mitochondria and such exist within them. So all the levels are present at the same time. The third is that you get these homeostatic environments that are created that are perfect environments for the sub, sub uh, components, like these cities that we were seeing, or the way, you know, I traveled from my house in Princeton to uh, Seoul, Korea, and I didn't go out from under a roof. I mean, that's pretty protected environment. The same thing with a bacterium or a cell. Uh, the component parts get completely refashioned. Uh, uh, a, a mitochondrion is no longer a bacterium that is able to survive independently. Uh, and if you look at us and what that means for us, take the example of the gray wolf. Well, the gray wolf in just a short period of time has evolved into canine domesticus. Look at all these variants, and they're much more well-fitted for this larger environment and much more successful and very diverse. And that's using very crude tools of, uh, of selection that occurred. And we are being auto-domesticated right now. And as we start to use really powerful tools on ourselves that are coming out of the, of the revolution in molecular biology, well, you can imagine lots of transformations that we ourselves will undergo. Um, so that's sort of free-range humans, this notion which is very nice. I hate to see them disappear. But unfortunately, I think that that's very, very likely to occur. Um, and where are humans going to remain? They're going to remain in the little back eddies of this great change of uh, uh, advance that occurs, in little environments that are probably very well suited for us. And uh, but that's, we're not going to be free range anymore, I think. And the other thing that you can say is that um, time scales expand. I mean, the, the larger organisms are operating at much broader time scales, which is why at the lower level it's hard to see what's going on. And I think it's very hard for us to see what's happening in this larger, in this larger structure. And also, the emergent properties are... Uh, you know, way beyond what's happening at a, at a lower level. So as an example of that, uh, an amygdala cell in our brains. I mean, what does an amygdala cell have to understand about fear? Which is what it's, in, you know, it's intimate in that process. Uh, I think very little, and I think our, our level of understanding probably about what's going on at a larger, uh, at this larger planetary level is the same way. And the key question is, this dual transition in materials and in organizational complexity, um, uh, is there really going to be a singularity? 
uh, in the sense that it's this opaque sort of place where we can't see the future. Uh, to me, you know, it's kind of already underway. Uh, m most everything about the future is really relatively opaque to us. I mean, you only have to look at the sub, uh, subprime crisis and any number of things like that to see how po poor we are at predicting the future and, uh, you know, the imp what occurred with the Internet or the arrival of spam. Uh, we give ourselves credit for a lot more than we actually can do at this point. And, you know, the intelligence around us is probably already beyond human, and we'll talk about how that's going to accelerate. And it, it seems that the, the future is going to get very, very weird very quickly. I think that's a good way of capturing it. Um, now, the real question is, when is this going to occur, if there is a moment of it occurs? And we care a lot about that. I care a lot about it because I'd like to see it. But, you know, does it really matter if it's 20 years or 50 years or 100 years or, heaven forbid, 1,000 years or 10,000 years or 500,000 years? I mean, all this is just an instant in this larger sweep of time and evolution. And it's really pretty clear that this is a robust development and it's going to happen. And the question is, what is it going to mean for humans? And that brings us back to our evolutionary perspective and to, a, um, to our evolutionary perspective and to human ethics and values. And so, first of all, human ethics and values, they're not unique to us at all. Uh, they're critical to primate uh, social strategy, and they're a way to affect behavior that works in a species that's social, that has uh, you know, few offspring, small kinship groups, uh, long childhood, extended social ties, uh, and chimps have the basic building block for this. They have sharing, they have empathy, they have loyalty, they have reciprocity, they console losers, uh, they have a sense of fairness. And uh, look at this. This is an example from Cameroon where a, a Dorothy who was 40 years old died and was being taken out. And all the chimps who were normally jumping up and down and playing and doing all sorts of things, they came over and they just stood there in silence and watched. This was like mourning. And here's a, a chimpanzee that's trying to comfort a crying child, not doing a real good job of it there, apparently. <laughs> I was wondering whether she's crying because of that, but <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, and the other thing they do is they really treat in-groups very differently from out-groups, something that we do a lot of. And, you know, we think that we can reason about values and, uh, you know, ethical frameworks, but they're trumped by raw emotion because that's what's driving these things. They're an evolutionary tool, and that's why things can go awry so quickly. Lebanon was at peace for 2,000 years, and then suddenly, for some reason, it, you know, it blew apart into the civil war. Same thing in Bosnia and what happened in uh, Srebrenica. And so we have these, these things that arise, and, you know, if, it weren't, if we weren't primates, values would look very, very different. Uh, ant ant uh, ethics and values would be so different. And I think E.O. Wilson captured it really right when he said that uh, Marx just got the wrong species, uh, <laughs> which I think is probably really true. Um, so the, if we change ourselves and are living in a completely different environment, why in the world would we expect human primate values to persist, and, or the emotions that drive our, our use of these and our attachment to these sorts of things. So, you know, what would values be like in, a cyber, in cyberspace? Well, first of all, you got really strong, turbocharged competition. Copies cheap, they're plentiful, lots of, up, uh, lots of backups. Boundaries between entities are going to be very, very weak and easy to breach in a variety of ways or, or blending. And you're probably not going to have sex in the traditional, which is, drives a lot of our values. So it's at least vestigial. Um, so to me, uploading, in my view, is going to lead to the disappearance of humans that upload kind of through the skylight. Uh, uh, driven by evolutionary pressures that lead them to uh, sort of disengage from whatever remains behind and embark on their own journey in a very, very different place and towards very, very different things. And what's interesting, this image from Michael Anisimov's website uh, is very Christian in its tonality to it. 
uh, it's very evocative of transcendence and an afterlife and departure from the world, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but you have to ask the questions. I mean, what vestige of humanness would remain in 100 years if you were in, in space? And that would be 100 human years. What would such things have in common with biological creatures? And would individuality even remain? Would it kind of bleed away in some sense? It's hard for me to imagine that that wouldn't occur. And so such a transition beyond human to something other is, I think, unappealing to many transhumanists. And some of them, uh, Bostrom and, and Schulman, uh, you know, they express it in terms of, Nick, Nick mentions the gradual elimination of all forms of beings that we care about and what a loss this would be and how we have to stop that happening. Or uh, Carl says, an emulation of a population with quite inhuman values. And that's kind of part of a tonality of what a disaster this would be. Um, so much so that they've come up with some mechanisms by that which that wouldn't really happen and uh, by which the human could somehow be preserved. And the ideas kind of boil down to one thing, stop the evolutionary process in some way or at least manage it in a very tight way. And to me, I look at the mechanisms for that, and the path there seems kind of divorced from what I look at are very messy transitions that occur in the real world, the things that we're approaching. Um, uh, and the regimes themselves seem kind of unstable, at least over the long term. I mean, they would have to survive for an eternity, essentially. Uh, but the, they're, extreme, they're well thought out, and they're intriguing themes. And they boil, there are two of them. One is kind of a singleton rule, where you have, and, and Nick Bostrom uh, mentioned that, where you have maybe the first human emulation that precedes, um, that would precede the creation of strong AI, which would supposedly have some semblance of interest in human values, and sort of is very smart and realizes what's going to happen to the future and is able to orchestrate things way beyond what we clumsy beings are capable of today in terms of managing anything, and somehow sort of implements copying controls and such and sort of stops the uh, evolutionary process in some way to retain its own existence. And another approach is uh, superorganism communities, essentially, which have sort of standards because they're collaborating so well that you can't sort of diverge from them too far. And this was by Carl Schulman and some others. And once again, is smart enough to see the future and to protect against its own demise that it would care about in some way and still has sort of human qualities to it and is going to control this space. Now, I think personally, that if the only way to retain the human is to actually stop evolution uh, by switching to some sort of top-down control or orchestrated handling, that the human is bound to disappear, at least in that space. And, but I look at it, and you know, I say, well, isn't that the kind of most natural thing that you'd expect to happen from the broader sweep of evolution? I mean, we derive our sense of specialness, we humans, by the world that we have created, by being the bridge to this other level of organizational complexity and integrating new materials. And we kind of extract a larger sense of who we are. We wouldn't seem so, so special if we were at a Pleistocene level at this point. So we derive it from what we've created. And you know, are we really going to be able to reach in and stop that now? I mean, look at all the other previous advances that have occurred. And there's always a sense of loss and birth and moving on to something, something else. Now, in general terms, I've debated a lot of these sorts of issues of change. And usually, they come in the biological realm. So talk about cloning, for example. And where people really heatedly argue about whether you should clone creatures or have you know, uh, designer children, important stuff. And they say, you know, they're either very enthusiastic about it. This is going to lead to some sort of uh, a blonde haired, blue eyed, wonderful future where we're all going to be happy. Or, oh my God, we're going to be manufacturing humans. They're going to be like vegetables. And this is like a disaster. We have to pull away from that. And it's easy to kind of think how silly this is because not only because clones, you know, aren't here yet. And when they arrive, a delayed identical twin is not really going to shake up civilization that much. Um, and because they'll seem so quaint when future humans, whatever, whoever they are, look back on this and are dealing with real change, 
I mean, this is going to seem like such a tiny little thing to be arguing about. Um, but, you know, when I think about it, we shouldn't really be so smug because, or I shouldn't, because these, these debates make a lot of sense if you're thinking that these are just symbols. These are op opportunities to talk about the future and the, um, essentially, the ideas that are put forth are exactly the same. If you're talking about genetic engineering, if you're talking about cloning, if you're talking about in vitro fertilization or about uh, human enhancement or AI, uh, the arguments are virtually identical. There, there's going to be slippery slopes. We're just, oh, we're on the slippery slope. And every time people argue about being on the slippery slope, there's another slippery slope that we could avoid somehow, which I don't understand that. But losses of identity, these abhorrent things that are going to happen, or perverted values, perversion of everything that we've built up. And, you know, it's a lot of angst it brings. But, you know, they really should be worried about it because the lines are blurring between the natural and the artificial, between biology and technology, between the living and the non-living, between the born and the made. This is big stuff that's happening. Of course people are concerned about it and have some angst. And in my view, the idea of preserving human values through the singularity comes from this same place as all these previous sort of assaults. Maybe it doesn't have quite the same tonality, but the idea that we're going to think that some we or some super AI is going to somehow hold the reins to this future and manage and control it is, it comes from that space and that we're simply not going to be able to do that. This is, we can't even do anything in the present. I mean, the most modest of things we can't do with lots of things beyond just our own intellect. And we're not going to be able to do it in the mind-boggling, sort of chaotic, complex, emergent realm that we're careening towards. We're at the wrong organizational level to do that. It's like cells determining the nature of multicellular life. And so, you know, when you're moving forward to this stuff and shaping how soon it's going to happen and all these things, it's certainly not going to be driven by uh, people that are constrained by regulation, by fear, by caution. It's going to come from the nimble from the bold, from those who embrace the possibilities of the future. And it's going to be quite a ride whenever the singularity happens. And so I'll close with a final quote that comes from 2,500 years ago, Thucydides, the great Athenian historian, who really has a, a comment for us all. I think the bravest are surely those with the clearest vision of what is before them, glory and danger alike and yet notwithstanding, go out and meet it, and I think that's what the Singularity Institute is doing, and that's all. Thank you. <laughs>